morning. We want to welcome you to the worship service at Mars Hill Church of Christ. We're glad that you're with us today. Uh, we saw several out in the parking lot, and uh, we're happy that you were able to be with us in person. And if you're tuned in on YouTube, we appreciate you joining us uh, there as well. Uh, we'll begin our worship this morning with reading and prayer, uh, and Kevin Dillon will be leading us in that. Today's Bible reading comes from the first epistle of Peter, chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil against you, as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Shall we pray? Our great, merciful God, who loves us, in whom we live and move and have our very being on this earth, we are so grateful for your might, for your compassion, for your purity and your holiness, that we might have a wonderful God who not only cares for us, but serves as an example for us as to how we should live. Thank you, Father, for being a light that shines in a dark place. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we, we will be the city set on a hill that cannot be hid, that we might shine the light of our Christian influence to cause this world to be brighter and better. We pray, Heavenly Father, today for the missionaries in foreign fields, we know that even the United States itself is a missionary co country now because there's so much evil here. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us to return to you as a one nation under God and that we will um, be able to spread your gospel to the utmost corners of the earth. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus, our Savior. Thank you, Lord, because we would have no life without him, no chance, no hope. And we're grateful, Father, that you are the fountain of every good and perfect gift. Watch over us today. Help us to be the people you want us to be. Help us to be that royal nation, that holy priesthood, that peculiar people that stands out. And we pray, Father, that people may be able to see your glory through the works that we do for, your, for you and in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we join in song in our worship this morning, we'll begin with number 282, I Know That My Redeemer Lives, 282. <clears throat> I know that my Redeemer lives and never prays for me. I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. He wills that I should wholly be in word and thought, indeed. Then I his holy face may see when from this earth I freed. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that over yonder 
there stands a place prepared for me. A home, a house not made with hands, most wonderful to see. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. Our next song is number 842, A Common Love. 842. <clears throat> a common love for each other, a common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding us to the Lord. A common hope, strength when we're weary, a common hope for tomorrow, a common joy in the truth of God's word. In just a moment, we'll be uh, taking the Lord's Supper, remembering the sacrifice that was made for us by our Savior. And before we do that, we'll sing 916, Come Share the Lord. 916. <clears throat> we gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord. We one is a stranger here, everyone belongs, finding our forgiveness here. We in turn forgive all wrongs. He joins us here. He breaks the bread. The Lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord. We are now a family of which the Lord is head. The unseen he meets us here. In the breaking of the bread, we'll gather soon where angels sing. We'll see the glory of our Lord and coming King. Now we anticipate the feast for which we wait. Come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord. Good morning to everyone on this special uh, Valentine's morning, and it's great that we can all be here uh, to worship together and to commune together uh, right now. Go ahead and open your Bibles up to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, a very fitting passage um, for today as we talk about uh, God's love for us, Christ's love for us, and how um, we can uh, think about that love as we think about the cross and what those blessings mean to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. 
It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and love endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. We know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. For, uh, but when I became a man, I grew up from childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. And indeed, that's exactly what the cross was about. It was about love. Love endures all things. Jesus on the cross endured all things for us. Love bears all things. It believes all things. Uh, when you think back, I'm sure, to a lot of you at your weddings, um, you saw you, this passage was read, and you were reminded about love. And maybe over today, you will maybe get that wedding video out, or you will be reminded of that love you have for your family and for others. But no greater love uh, does man have than to lay down his life uh, for his friends. John 15, verse 13. The Bible indeed has a lot to say about love, but there is no greater example, John chapter 3, verse 16, than God's love for the world, in that his only son, his special son, he sent to the world so that we can be saved. And when you think about that love, and you think about 1 Corinthians chapter 13, in the, in the essence of, of communion, and about how God's love for us is patient and kind, even though we mess up, even though we sin and fall short, love does not envy, it does not boast. It is not arrogant or rude or insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. The truth is simply this. God loved us so much that he gave us his son. He taught us how to love because 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, he first loved us. And so as we think about that love for each other, we think about that love for the world around us, we know we have that because Christ loved us. And that was the message of the cross, in that it does not keep up with wrongdoing, but Christ bears all things. He believed in us, believes all things, and he has hope in us that we can change this world. And lastly, it endures all things. The love of the cross never ends. Let's pray as we think about that sacrifice of the cross. God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for that body that hung on the cross that endured the beating and all, all of the things uh, that surrounded the events of the cross so that we could be saved. His body uh, there uh, on, the, on the cross as it hung there between heaven and earth. It was suspended and he endured so much for us and we are grateful for that. Help us to show love to others as, as you loved us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. When you think back to Abraham and that ultimate sacrifice that God asked Abraham to make um, with Isaac, his son, and as they were going up the hill there uh, to make that sacrifice, and, and Isaac's looking around, and he's kind of putting two and two together, and he realizes there's no sacrifice. Uh, God was testing Abraham. He was seeing how much Abraham loved, loved God. And when you look at that, it's a very difficult, as a father, it's a very difficult passage to read. It's a very diff difficult story to comprehend. But most importantly, God provided. Because God's love believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And again, God's love never ends. And that's, that's what the cross is about. That's what the blood is about. Is that it doesn't keep up with, with wrongdoing. It doesn't keep score doesn't say, okay, you've done, you've done too much sin, the blood can't cleanse that. It cleanses all sin, as long as we continue to walk in the light as he is the light. So together as Christians, as light in a dark world around us this morning, we get to commune with that blood. We get to have in common the forgiveness and be reminded of that 
and examine ourselves as we partake of this. And so as we go to God in prayer, we're grateful for that love. We're grateful for this fruit of the vine that represents Jesus' blood. Let's pray together. God, we pray a blessing um, over this uh, fruit of the vine and as we can partake of it and, and as we can think of Christ's sacrifice and the blood that flowed freely for us that represents your love. We thank you so much for the cross and what it represents, the forgiveness and the healing, uh, the reunion that we can have uh, one day with you in heaven, uh, and that all saints can be gathered and we can continue to do this, uh, to, to have communion or, or be together and to share. Thank you for uh, your son, and as we take of this, help us to look at our lives. Hopefully we can grow closer to you through this. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. As everybody leaves uh, in the uh, parking lot, you'll have the opportunity to give. And if you are with us virtually today and you want to get that uh, contribution for the office, you can mail that or drop it by um, as we're able to, to give back and continue to uh, help the church to grow. We'll pray over those funds now and a special blessing over our leadership here at Marcia. Let's, let's bow together. God, we thank you for the church. We thank you for this special congregation here at Mars Hill and uh, what it represents, the truth that we can represent, uh, the, the love that we can share. We pray for uh, our leaders, uh, for Mac and for Tim and Randy and, and what they mean to us and pray a blessing um, over uh, their guidance as they make decisions um, with the funds collected each and every week uh, to help us grow closer uh, to you and help spread your word. And we pray a blessing over them as they make decisions uh, with those funds and also with, with the congregation here in, in the pandemic that they will uh, always keep in mind uh, us worshiping and growing closer to each other, closer to you, but also keeping us safe. We pray over the rest of this worship uh, that it can be a blessing to us and that we can be a blessing to those around us the rest of this week. Pray for safety and the winter storms coming up and that you will watch over us. And a special blessing over our sick and the ones that we love that haven't been able to be with us for some time. Ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Following Chris's message this morning, we'll sing number 207 as a song of encouragement. 207. Uh, and before the lesson, uh, God is love, number 180. 180. Come, let us all unite to sing, God is love. Let heaven and earth their praises bring, God is love. Let every soul from sin awake, each in his heart sweet music make, and sing with us for Jesus' sake, for God is love god is love god is love come let us all unite to sing that god is love how happy is our portion here god is love his promises our spirits cheer god is love he is our sun and shield by day our help our hope our strength and stay he will be with us all the way our god is love god is love god is love come let us all unite to sing that god is love Good morning to you all. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. If you're in our 
parking lot or viewing uh, virtually, we want to let you know that it's an honor that you are here with us and hope that uh, you will be safe in the next few days. As Matt said, look out for that winter weather. Uh, I, for one, uh, kind of am excited about a little snow, maybe a little ice. I don't want anybody to get hurt or wreck their car, but uh, that's always fun around the Moran household. So uh, be weather aware. Happy Valentine's Day. We'll get into some some love stuff here in just a moment, but we appreciate uh, all of our good families here and hope that you have a good day together. We'll begin as we normally do with our prayer list, Miss Margaret Marks, the Sparkmans, uh, the Roberts, especially Gail and her treatments. She is at home, uh, but no visitors at this time. Cornelia Ragster still at Jane's house, and she is doing some better. Jack is home from the hospital and is, is finally doing some better, so we're especially praying for Jane as she's taking care of Jack and, and Cornelia. Uh, David Underwood Sr. remains at Summit Rehab. Uh, he has changed rooms. He's no longer in 28, uh, but I failed to write down the, the new room number. Uh, you can ask uh, Junior uh, for that information. Uh, Richard Taylor uh, continues to send his love and appreciation. Hubert Powell in our parking lot. We're still um, praying that he will feel better. June Smith and her family, Don Pollard. And Kay Beavis. Kay will be having some tests uh, this week, possibly some procedures coming up. So uh, we want to remember Kay as well. Tim Malden will be moving to UAB soon, uh, hopefully in the next day or two, uh, to, to uh, receive some more advanced treatment. We're hoping that that goes well and the move can be good for him. We're remembering Janice Cox, Cooper Smith, James Harris, Anita Haddock, uh, Sarah Jane, and her son Sean. Uh, Avery Thompson, and we're going to add uh, Michael Alejandro to our prayer list this morning. Michael is the son of Rod Alejandro. Uh, Rod is the preacher at Key West, and they're really good friends with uh, Philip and Debbie May. Uh, Michael is suffering through uh, some uh, mental depression right now. Uh, very understandable with everything going on in this world. There's a lot of folks who are, who are suffering, but we do want to mention uh, Michael Alejandro this morning. Uh, in our prayer lists. Uh, always remember, uh, Wednesday nights we have our Bible study at 7 o'clock with uh, Matt and myself. If you'd like to join us in that, let me know, or Matt know. And always remember that we are constantly uh, looking out for this congregation and our elders would appreciate your prayers as we uh, make plans to transition uh, in the future back into the building. Uh, some good news uh, coming soon about that. We have been talking in the last few weeks about how truth always triumphs and how God's truth is the truth that we are considering. Jesus says in John 17 to verse 17, sanctify them with your truth. Uh, your truth is the only truth uh, that we follow. And so we want to continue that study uh, this morning. I don't know how many more of these we will have. I know at least one more, uh, but we may have uh, two or three, depending on how things uh, work out. But we'll begin this morning by saying this. If you have acknowledged God's word to be truth, if you have believed God's word to be truth, and if you are obeying God's word as truth, then your life should look substantially different from some of those around you. Kevin read this morning in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning of verse 9, Peter says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. King James Version renders special here as peculiar. Uh, therefore, we are a peculiar people, which simply means that we're different from the status quo. We think differently. Our perspectives are different. We walk in this world differently. We speak differently. We, we have a different look about us as Christians. Now, Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 will explain this phenomenon by Paul saying, We have not been conformed to the world, but been transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we may prove that what is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. This is why we are different, because we do things differently. We do things the way that God has prescribed. And, of course, Peter in this text would agree with this reasoning. Uh, the reason we're different, the reason that we are special or peculiar people is so that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
who once were not a people, but now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. If we didn't have any other reason in this world to, to praise God and glorify His name, then this would, be the, this would be all we need. He has taken us out of a place of darkness. He has taken us out of sin. Literally, Paul would say in Colossians chapter 1, He has conveyed us from darkness and placed us in the kingdom of the Son of His love. He has pulled us from one place and put us into a place of light so that we could walk in the light. But not only that, is He has granted us mercy. Mercy when we don't deserve it. Grace when we don't deserve it. Love that we don't deserve. God has given all of these things to us. How can we not give praises to God? How can we not talk about this wonderful grace and mercy that He has bestowed on us? This is the reason that we are different. This is the reason that we're special. This is the reason that we're peculiar because we're supposed to be doing something that nobody else in the world does, and that is give praise and honor and glory to God. Well, Peter would go on by saying, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners, as pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. We are sojourners. We are travelers in this world. We do not belong here. And the world knows it. The world knows that we do not belong here. And they would do just about all of it they can do to get rid of us. Suppress Christianity. Take away our rights and freedoms. Set laws against our beliefs. But this comes at no surprise because we understand that long before we were born on this planet, they hated Christianity. Jesus himself says in John 15, 18 and 19, If the world hates you, just know that it hated me before it hated you. And if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. That's, that's why we're different. We're not a part of the world. We're not a part of the, the crowd around us. When, when the crowd is going south, we go north because that's in the direction of God. When they're going the wrong way, we go the right way. That's just who we are. We're different. We're peculiar. Uh, we don't fit the qu uh, status quo. And so we continue to be God's special people. We continue to proclaim His praises, proving His good and acceptable, perfect will. Peter would go on to say, Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. We can't get so caught up in the philosophy of the world that we forget about our purpose in this world. That purpose is to allow others to observe our good works, our praises, our faith, our love, and our attitude in a way that they too will glorify God, in a way that they too will become uh, trustworthy of God. It's never about us. It's never about, look how good I am, look how much I know. It's never about, look how much I have or, or what I've accomplished but everything that we do is supposed to have Jesus' stamp of approval on it in a way that it gives glory to God. And isn't this really our purpose on this planet? Isn't this really the, the purpose of Christianity, what living for God and God's Word in this life is all about, so that others will glorify Him as well? I've been reading a book by Phil Robertson called The Theft of America's Soul. And in this book, he recounts the story of his conversion and he goes on and he says finally he come to the a point in his spiritual maturity when he began to to make sense of things he said i'd spent 28 years under the influence of satan i knew it'd take time to untangle all those lies and you can't untangle the lies of the devil when you're still running with his children i knew what i needed to do in other words phil knew that he had to break some uh, friendships. He had to quit running around uh, from some of his old running buddies because every time they would come around he would wind up getting in trouble again. He said uh, about a year went by and one of his good friends, he calls him Big Al, managed to track him down and Big Al had a couple of friends with him and, and this was the conversation. He said that they were going to State Line Road to party and promised it'd be a grand time. Phil said, I knew better. 
knew the way the lie would turn out. I'd wind up drunk, hanging over the toilet, full of guilt and shame, unable to look my church family in the eye. So I told Big Al and the gang I wouldn't be joining them. He frowned and asked if I were on some religious kick. I said, boys, uh, this is permanent. They didn't mock me, didn't belittle me. They just stood there confused. The one you're looking for, I told them, referring to the old Phil Robertson, well, he's dead. The old gang stood there perplexed, but Big Al didn't hesitate to share his opinion. He said I couldn't stay committed to this nonsense of Jesus, and for added effect, he says, when all of this is over, Phil, just give me a call. Well, Phil goes on to explain how a few of his old friends would come by and see him, and, and some of them began to start believing in Jesus because of, of Phil and, and his teaching, but not, not Big Al. About 12 years had passed um, since his conversion, and Phil got a call from Big Al, and he wanted to meet Phil and talk. Big Al said, I've been keeping up with you. I must admit, I've never seen such a change in a man. He went on to say that he had received some bad news from his doctor, that he had an aneurysm on his heart that was ready to bust at any time and it would end his life if, if that did take place. And so Phil said, I sized him up and I asked him, so you, you having second thoughts about this whole atheism thing, aren't you? And that's where the conversation began. Now here's the point. It was about two months later that Phil received a call that the aneurysm had burst and Big Al had passed away but he wanted Phil to preach his funeral. And this is what Phil Robertson said at his funeral. He said, let me tell you a story about a man, the man in the casket. His body is there, but he is gone. A couple of months ago, I had the privilege of baptizing Alan into the family of Christ. He cut it thin, <laughs> but he made it. And he said, before leaving the stage, he said, I looked down in the casket, and he says, my old buddy, I'll see you again. Peculiar different we are a chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation his own special people that we may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light i'm not saying phil robertson's a perfect person but all i'm saying is he chose to live a life that was different he chose to live a life that was peculiar and all of these people that were around him all the people that he used to run with they saw this change in him and it wound up into a soul being saved uh, and is in heaven waiting uh, for that return. So how do we do it? How do we live honorably in a sin-damaged and corrupted world? How do we live in such a way that others will glorify God simply by observing our life? Well, I think I have an answer um, that will get us at least going in the right direction. And that answer has to do with a little bit about Valentine's Day and love. If we truly want to live a life that glorifies God, then we must develop a love for God's Word. We have got to develop a love for God's Word. And that comes from spending time with it, learning to trust in it, and meditating on what God has taught us through His Word. And, and this is true with any relationship. You put time and effort into it. You do all that you can do to strengthen it. And the more you experience the goodness of that relationship, the more you love it. And the more you love it, the more you, you just talk about it. The more you want to tell everybody else about that relationship. See, developing a, a love for the truth means that we speak His words unashamedly to whomever is around. The psalmist writes in Psalm 119, beginning in verse 46, I will speak your testimonies before the kings and will not be ashamed. I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. My hands also, I will lift up your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. See, as Christians, we don't adjust our conversation depending on who is in our presence. Through the years, I've known some folks, and perhaps y'all have too, that they would have their church language, and they would have their non-church language. And the language that they would choose was all contingent on who was around. It, if it was church people, they'd speak the church language. If it wasn't, then they wouldn't speak the church language. Uh, I will speak your testimonies even before kings. It, it doesn't matter who's around. We, we don't change our, our praises and our glory to God because of who's around. We, we do it even more when those folks are around. By the way, did I mention that Phil Robertson actually had a chance to sit down and talk to Donald Trump? And someone asked him, what did, what did you say? He said, I, I preached the gospel to him. 
And he says, I don't know if he'll follow it or not or remember it, but he said he knows the truth. I will speak even to kings, even to dignitaries. Number two, developing a, a love for God's word leads us into only wanting to live in his truth, and his truth only. Psalm 119, 113, the psalmist says, I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. According to Boyce, double-minded people are people who know about God, but are not fully determined to worship and serve Him only. They are those who want both God and the world. They want the benefits of a true religion, but they also want their sin as well. But the psalmist says that he hates double-mindedness, even when it comes to oneself. And this is exactly what James tells us in James 1, beginning in verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not the man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways." We have got to develop a, a love for God's Word that says, you know what, I believe God's Word no matter what the, the popular culture around me is saying. I believe God's Word no matter what my friends and family have experienced. I believe God's Word so much so that I'm going to dedicate, I'm going to commit my life to it. Because we don't want to be double-minded. We, we don't want to say we have faith and then, then doubt God uh, any other time. We, when we say we have faith, then we have to display that faith in our life. Developing a love for God's Word helps us prioritize our life. Psalm 119, 127, the psalmist says, Therefore, I love your commandments more than gold, yes, than fine gold. I love what Bridges says here. Should I not love them? Can gold, yea, fine gold, offer me blessings such as these? Can it heal my broken heart? Can it give relief to my wounded spirit? Has it any peace or prospect of comfort for me on my deathbed? There were some in the context of Psalm 119 and 127 who were saying that God's word was void. It was obsolete. It was no good. It was of no effect. Even to the point of receiving money like those in Titus chapter 1 and verse 11, they were teaching things that they ought not to teach for the sake of dishonest gain. They were directly going against God's word just so that they could find a, a resource of money. And buddy, you can turn on the internet right now and see a lot of those teachers who are teaching false things, things that they ought not, simply for that personal gain. But the psalmist says, not me. I'm not going to fall into that trap. I know who can heal my broken heart. I know who can give relief to my wounded spirit. I know who gives peace and comfort to me even on my deathbed. Therefore, I will love him more than anything. Above all else, he is first in my life. All the love that I have to give, he gets the first and most. Developing a love for God's word helps us to prioritize our lives. Matthew 6 and 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. Before any worry, before any concern, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Next, developing a love for God's word helps us become pure, to remain pure, and to love the pure things of God in this life because his word is pure. Psalmist says in Psalm 119 and 140, your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. Why would we settle for anything less than purity? Why would we subject ourselves to the impurities of life? Things that harm the soul, things that pollute our spirit, things that damage our relationships, things that cost us our eternity. Why would we allow these contaminations fill our hearts and our minds? Why do we settle for anything less than, than purity? Why do we let these things overrun and overtake us? The psalmist says, I love your word because it is pure. You know, things in this life that are infested with sin and shame and guilt, those things should disgust us and not appeal to us. 
We should turn our eyes and heads away and not turn to these things. Psalm 119, 158 through 60 says, I see the treacherous and I'm disgusted because they do not keep your word. Consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, Lord, according to your loving kindness. The entirety of your word is truth and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 22, Paul would say, Flee youthful lust and pursue pure things, things like righteousness and faith and love and peace. Well, those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And we couldn't uh, leave out of Philippians 4 and verse 8. Paul says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true and noble and just and pure and lovely and of a good report and virtuous and praiseworthy, meditate on those things. And I will remind you that word meditate takes on the meaning of taking an inventory. Meditate on these things. Think about things that are true and noble and just and pure and lovely and take an inventory of your life to make sure that these things are present in your life. Purity. Why would we settle for anything less? Developing a love for God's Word helps us to become more and more appreciative of who He is and all that He does. Let me turn your attention to Psalm 119, beginning in verse 166. The psalmist says, Lord, I hope for your salvation. And I do your commandments. My soul keeps your testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I, I keep your precepts and your testimonies, for all my ways are before you. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your word. My lips shall utter praise. For you teach me your statutes. My, my tongue shall speak of your word. For all your commandments are righteousness. Let your hand become my help, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live, and it shall praise you, and let your judgments help me. I have gone astray like a sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Just think of, of all of the wonderful things that, that the psalmist says here God does for us. He, he, he gives us salvation. He, he looks for us when we're lost. He, he gives us his love. He delivers us. His, his words are truth and they deliver us. Therefore, we should utterly praise him with all that we do and say. You see, developing and cultivating and retaining a love for God's word is what separates us from the rest of the world. Love for God's Word is what makes us different. It's what makes us special. It's what makes us peculiar because if we love God's Word, then we can't help but to, to, to teach and to speak and to preach God's Word. But you see, the, the love of God's Word also factors in to where we spend eternity. You know, if you really love someone, you spend time with them. You, you want to be around them. You, you take care of them, you listen to them, you believe in them, you follow their good instruction. I want you to consider Paul's words in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Beginning in verse 9, he says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. With all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Another translation words it like this. He will use everything that God disapproves to deceive those who are dying, those who refuse to love the truth that would save them. If we do not love the truth of God's word, then, then we're not going to follow it. We're not going to obey it. We're not going to live by it. And that's why we said at the beginning, if we believe God's word to be true, if we acknowledge God's word to be true, if we're living like God's word is truth, then there should be something different about us. There is an absolute objective truth that will save us, and that's contained in God's word. But for those who refuse to spend time with it, for those who will refuse to listen to it, believe in it, and follow its good instruction, for those who will refuse to love God's word, they open themselves up to believe and to follow things and people whose only purpose and desire is to destroy their soul. 
Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. Let your mercies come also to me. O Lord, your salvation according to your word, so shall I have an answer for him who reproaches me. For I trust in your word. I take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth. For I have hoped in your ordinances, so shall I keep your law continually. Forever and ever I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. I will speak of your testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. And I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. My hands also I lift up to your commandments, which I love. And I will meditate on your statutes. Remember the word to your servant upon which you have caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, for your word has given me life. <laughs> That's the Psalm 119, 40 through 50. I just think it is so beautiful. Your word has given me life. Church, why would we settle for anything less than God's word? Why do we settle for anything less than what God would provide us through his word, the hope and, and the comfort and the salvation that he has promised and guaranteed us through the spirit and the blood of Jesus Christ? Why in the world would we settle for anything less? But the truth is, is we, we do. And some are still settling for less. And that might be where you find yourself in your relationship with the Lord this morning, that you love Him, but you're not living like it. You've acknowledged His Word to be truth. You believe His Word to be truth, but maybe you're not showing that in your life. If that's the case, then there's no better time than the present, right now, to, to make that right with God. Seek forgiveness uh, from Him through prayer and, and, and just reset and just start anew this morning. If you've not yet become a Christian, if you've not yet become a child of the living God, through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, through the watery grave, rising to, to live a life anew, then, then it's ready. It, it's, it's waiting. There's no better time than now. There's no better group of people than, than what are gathered uh, on this campus today. If we can help you in any way, we can pray with you. We can pray for you. I'm going to be standing right outside. Let me or somebody know before you leave. Uh, we want to do that for you this morning as we sing with Kevin. Hark the gentle voice of Jesus falleth tenderly upon your ear. Sweet his cry of love and pity calleth. Turn and listen, he stay and hear. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. Then his loving, tender voice obeying, bear his yoke, his burden take. Find the yoke, his hand is on you, laying light and easy for his sake. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. Again, we want to thank everyone for being with us this morning. I was passed a, a, a note to, to add to our announcements. Uh, we're asked to keep in mind a young lady named Bella Winters. She's 10 years old. Uh, her family uh, are members at Petersville, uh, the church there. Uh, they received a call early yesterday uh, that there is a heart available for a heart transplant for that young lady. Uh, she is at Vanderbilt Hospital now. Uh, and if things go well today, uh, including with the weather, uh, she will be able to receive that heart. Uh, it'll be about a 12 to 18 hour uh, procedure, surgery, but uh, please keep that family and that young lady in your prayers. Again, her name is Bella Winters. Um, let's all bow together and we'll be dismissed uh, with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful to you for this day. 
for your wisdom in preparing for us uh, the first day of the week to gather as your people to worship you. We pray, Father, the things we've done today have been pleasing to you, uh, and that we have honored your name. Uh, we pray, Father, that you'll be with those who need your care. We pray a special blessing on Bella Winters and her family uh, during this trying time. Uh, she does get to have the surgery today we pray father that the hands ministering to her will perform successfully and that she will have a, a long and useful life in your kingdom uh, we pray for the forgiveness of our sins we thank you for Jesus and for his blood that cleanses us and it's in his name that we pray amen <laughs> 